Lovely to see you, lovely to see you. Today, church, I'm just so privileged to be here and I just wanna thank my pastor too for surrendering his pulpit for today's sermon. That's an awesome responsibility, amazing privilege and all glory to his name in wanting to do him justice today. Family, we've been through so much together and I just want to encourage you all, absolutely every one of you, as we plow towards the fulfillment of all prophecy. And I do wanna encourage you because we're going through so much right now in this quarantine state. But there's a larger quarantine at play here. This is not COVID-19 I speak of, but the quarantine of sin, which has kept us separated from our God for so long, and he from us. And I'm sure his heart breaks, wanting us to come back to his sheepfold. But I did say I wanted to encourage you. There's good news. There's good news. Let me not hesitate to remind you that the things of Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, these things are all happening. We know this. I will not hesitate to remind you. It's a good thing that we know these things. But what I really want to share with you today is are, are we ready? Are we ready? And can we be ready? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can for the coming of his glory. So when we think of glory, we tend to think of that awesome outward manifestation, don't we? Of power and, and might and majesty. But there's so much more to glory, and there really is. And I just wanted to be quick to remind you that while we understand prophecy, while we understand that we are closing into the fulfillment of all time, and that our God will come, there's all evidence in the word that these things are true and accurate because we've seen them fulfilled in history. Why do I cover this territory? Why do I remind you of these things? It's so we can be ready. But more than this, we understand that the word of God is true. But more than this, I also understand from personal experience that he is a loving, invested, loving, dearly loving God who is coming back for his people. How do I know this? For all he has done for me. If it were not for my God, I would not be standing here today. It's the same God that raised me up from depression, the same God that raised me up from anxiety, the same God that actually blessed my feet because I was told I would never walk. And one day I got up in the dead of night and did just that and ran before I walked. So while we can look at prophecy, and we can know without a shadow of a doubt that he's coming, and he's coming in power, and he's coming in glory, and he's coming in majesty. We also have experienced a more intimate glory, a conversion of the heart, not so much an outward manifestation of it, which is so easy to understand and so easy to lay hold of, but the glorification of your heart, because when the Lord comes, he's... He's not going to change your heart. He will have already done this. Through everything the Lord taught when he came the first time and by beholding him we are changed. No, when he comes the second time in glory, he comes to complete the change and consummate our restoration back to the kingdom of God. I mean, that is good news, yes? So I want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, may your lives ever have the cross before you, what Jesus has done for you, the sanctifying influence on your character, because there is powerful, majestic glory in, hum in humility and the semblance of a quiet spirit. And we'll talk about that more. But let us, let us pray. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, how we love you, we adore you, and, and we behold you, Lord, because we know you're coming back soon. You're coming back for your church, Lord. Your word says so, and prophecy validates your word, and this, by this we know, Lord, your word is good, and you will not leave us orphans. You will return, and when you do, Lord, you will transform us outwardly, but now first inwardly, Lord, 
Father, we pray that we are ready. We're, we pray that we can know we can be ready with all assurance, Lord, and doubt it not because you are the craftsman. You're working on our hearts every day, Lord. We thank you for it, Father. We are so, so thankful. And we long for your soon return. Father, seal our hearts for your courts as we open your word today. And in Jesus' blessed name, I pray and we pray. Amen. What is glory? What is man's glory? You see, man has a different version of glory. His glory is anchored in striving. Sorry, my clicker. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Is, is glory the outward manifestation of it? Is it the prize awarded to a job well done? Is it the continual praise and hungry praise for ever more validation as we gain more and more traction? Sorry, my clicker's playing up. <laughs> But you can see what I mean. As we gain more and more things, we search for more validation, more and more and more, and it just keeps growing. And pretty soon, we're not just thinking about the things we've done or not just being thankful for a job well done. We actually come to expect it. And this is a tool of the enemy. It's so subtle because the enemy knows all he has to do is change your heart, is give you the semblance of pride and I speak as a man, I speak as one from experience, I have done this through the pursuit of praise through excellence. And it made me very selfish, so much so that I couldn't see the merit in others and it stopped my growth in many ways. So this is the definition of man's glory. <laughs> it's, it's so vastly different to the Lord's glory. Be with me, family. Can this pursuit of glory turn into selfishness in the heart? Can this prevent us from being where the Lord is? Absolutely it can. Because the Lord looks on the heart, not on the outward appearance. He looks at the heart to see who is installed as king. And he loves those qualities that are instilled in his heart, speaking to his glory. He loves them to be reflected in ours. So family, when I speak to you of glory, I speak first not of his second coming in glory, but in his humble first coming in glory, where the lamb came as a helpless babe. He grew, he lived, he ministered, he cared, and he died an excruciating death on the cross for all of us, and he came in humility. So that's, we've seen a little of man's glory, but what is God's glory? Remember, the enemy is always trying to produce, produce a counterfeit of what glory is, but God's the real deal. His glory is amazing. Let's ask God what he has to say about his glory, his glory. So when Moses appeared before the Lord and said, show me your glory, Lord, Show me your glory. The Lord says this. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. This account is recorded in Exodus 33, verses 19 to 23. You can see here at play a very different definition of glory when juxtaposed with man's glory. What, and what can we say of this? That God's glory is itself something altogether visible, tangible, but presently unattainable. Something that we can't even stand in. We're separated. We are quarantined from his presence and in his love and in his mercy and his great love for us, he withdrew that we might not be consumed and so set about the plan of salvation that was founded from the beginnings of the world to come and redeem a fallen people back to his heart of love, back to his heart of love. There's only one way, one way. And Moses, 
alluded to this, and we know the Lord is waiting for us, but Moses alluded to this. He said of his way, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I might know you, that I might find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And the Lord answered him and said, my presence will go with you and give you rest. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, it's the same rest he promised Moses and the children of Israel then, and it's the same rest that Christ himself promises to us even now. So we understand this as an outward manifestation of glory, of, of God's awesome power. When he appeared to Moses and the children of Israel on the mount, he came with this awesome, majestic, outward expression of his glory, powerful, so much so that the children of Israel had to withdraw and the Lord commanded them to stay away from the mountain. The elders themselves dared not approach any further. And this, this is the verse, this is the verse that describes his outward manifestation of glory. says, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days and the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, even today, we know prophecy teaches us to trust the word of God, but there is even evidence in nature speaking to God's glory because Mount Sinai itself, even today, is still blackened and charred from the presence of the glory of the Lord that abode on the mountaintop. It's it's a powerful testimony etched in nature to his glory. But later, when Moses ascended the mount, with the two fresh tables of stone for the Lord to write upon. Because did you know, friends, Moses broke all the Ten Commandments all in one go. (laughs) Sorry, I had to do that. I'm a dad, I'm allowed to do that. But when he returned to the mountain with the two fresh tables of stone and he appeared before the Lord, having asked him, show me your glory. This is what the Lord says in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. He says... And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, don't miss this, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty. That's glory. That's a very different definition of glory from what we've seen in man's glory for a pat on the back for a reward and a job well done no God's glory is majestic and vastly different it doesn't speak to the outward the outward glorification of man's ego but more to the glorification of the inner man and the character of the inner man listen to this God associates his glory with his name his goodness his compassion His patience, long-suffering with us. His graciousness, truthfulness, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his justice. Don't we want these things? Do we live in a world where these things are prevalent? No, we live in man's glory. We live in a different dominion right now. But when God's glory comes, when it came and when it will come, shows us a different story. When the Savior came the first time, he could have come with awesome power, majestic might. But what would that have done? What purpose would that have served? Because surely people would have seen him in his might and his power and his glory outwardly manifested and would have bent the knee. But remember, this is all about motive. The motive of the inner man. No outward manifestation can give you that only the interpersonal sharing of the glory of Jesus Christ and God himself can change your heart to behold such a thing so when Jesus came the first time he did not come 
in the semblance of power and majesty. He came as a helpless babe. He came in humility. Don't miss this. The Savior was born into Bethlehem, which in Hebrew is called house of bread. And he was born into a manger. Now, I, I may have shared this before, but I just, I don't want you to miss this. Such a humble thing. You've got the bread of life, Jesus, being born into the house of bread in a bread trough. That's what animals ate out of the manger. They ate barley and wheat out of a manger. And our Lord was born into that. Did he come in power and majesty? No, he came in humility and in so doing, he changed our hearts forever. I'd love to share something from a, from a dear writer, Sister White, because this is all about restoration. This is all about your motive, restoring your glory inside first, then outwardly. Sister White writes, Satan was exulting that he had succeeded in debasing the image of God in humanity when Jesus came to restore in man the image of his maker. None but Christ can fashion anew the character that has been ruined by sin. He came to expel the demons that had controlled the will. He came to lift us up from the dust, to reshape the marred character after the pattern of his divine character, and to make it beautiful with his own glory. It's beautiful. What a wonderful thing for him. For Sister White to write. Now here's the thing. Again, he did not come in might and power, but more in the spirit. And we see that when he reads the Isaiah scroll, fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah 61. He says, today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. These words have been fulfilled. He came in the spirit. He didn't come in outward manifestation of glory. He came in an inner manifestation of glory fulfilling prophecy but not just that you look at it it says he came in the name of the lord that's what god says he says that so he came in an inner glory in the name of the lord and not only that every act of kindness we see that we see his kindness his compassion and every selfless act of healing. This is his resume. This is how he showed us his glory. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit and by manifesting the spirit to those who had not seen before, who thought God would come in awesome majesty. They didn't understand. They thought he was coming as a lion. He came as a lamb. He's coming as a lion next. And they'll be waiting for a lamb. Praise the Lord that we have his word of truth that we can share with others to give them a blessed hope. Understanding this is, is so good for us to know and such a blessed reassurance. Every act of selfless kindness, he put forth not his own agenda. He deferred to others. This is his CV. This is how we know him, his character, his mercy, his grace. He healed the blind. He gave this man eyes from clay and his own spittle. He raised the dead to life. He comforted those that grieve. This is our Messiah coming in glory the first time. When we think of glory, we so often think of the outward manifestation of it. But it's a humble spirit that lived in him that he wanted to live in us. That we might be transformed when he comes in glory the second time. So we see Jesus doing all these wonderful things on the earth, manifesting his inner glory in an outward way that it might shape the hearts of others. He raised the dead. Friends, he's going to do it again. We're going to see this. He forgave the sinner. <laughs> and he paid the ransom. He was lifted up that all men might be drawn unto him. That's powerful. And if that doesn't change you, nothing can. Nothing can. It's powerful. And may that same spirit, that same blessed assurance live in us that we might understand this when he comes in glory unrivaled the second time. 
So this we know, as it did before Moses, when Moses said, show me your glory. All the goodness of the God of heaven passed before Moses. All his glory passed before Moses. Now all his glory passed before us, and we have beheld him in his kindness, his mercy, his gratitude, our gratitude towards him for everything he has done. He poured himself out for us. It's quite an amazing thing. But this we know, that he's coming again. How do we know he's coming again? How do we know? Uh, Prophecy, definitely, it tells us these things. But we also have that intimate experience with him. What he's done for you, he is an interpersonal, ordered, reasoning, relational God. And that's my appeal to you today, to make real that understanding in your hearts that he is coming again. We talk about it. We say, he's coming again. He's coming again. And he is. Praise God that he is. But do we really, are we anchored in that hope? I speak as a man, busy with my day's work. Sorry, Lord, I can't do this now. I'm going to do this because this is important. And this feeds me. And this gives me reassurance, validation, gratification. But Lord, how do I know you're coming again when I make it real? When I make it real in my inner man. And I would encourage and exhort you all to do the same. The same thing. Father, thank you for all you have done. How do we know he's coming back? We trust his word and the interpersonal testimony that he gives every single one of us. You all have a narrative to share the hope that is in you with others. And there's nothing that can be disputed. People can contest prophecy. They can contest other things like that. Other testimonies, other readings, other writings. They can do that, but they cannot refute your personal testimony. Make it real in here. Jesus is coming back. So I just want to make plain his selflessness. This is the glory we see at his first coming. And I'll I'll try and move along because I know time is short. Speaking to his selflessness. His giving preference to others. If the cross were not enough. If we hadn't seen it for ourselves at the cross. We left the puzzle in wonder at what Jesus does next. He's crucified on the cross. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind, this is something that's borne out when Peter and John race to the tomb after hearing news that their Savior is not in the tomb and that he's been seen. They race to the tomb. And this is what the biblical account says. In John 20, verse 5 to 7, it says, So they both ran together, and the other disciple, that's, that's John, outran Peter. And came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head. Not lying with the linen clothes. But folded neatly together in a place by itself now you think why what is all this about this is this is an unusual thing this is not what we associate with the plan of salvation and it seems almost as a footnote in the bible and then nothing more is said really nothing that's pertaining to this particular passage in scripture but to understand we need to understand what jesus has just been through because we're talking about his glory here his selflessness his heart his deferral to others Remember, he'd just gone through the agony of being abandoned by his friends. Abandoned by friends, betrayed by friends. The agony of the cross, the separation from the Father, from the Spirit. He'd never experienced that before. Try to imagine something you've never imagined before. Now try to imagine it. He had always known the presence of God. And suddenly, it was gone. That's what finished him. The crushing weight of sin for us and the separation from the Father. We are separated. We are quarantined. But not for much longer because he's coming back. And to understand a little bit more about what the Master said to us in this simple act, we need to look only into a little bit of understanding as to what would happen in Jewish times. Every Jewish boy understood this custom surrounding mealtimes. 
it was customary for when the master came down to eat, the servant would set the table. And then he would wait out of sight while the master continued to eat. And when the master had finished eating, he would rise, wipe his hands with the napkin, his beard, his fingers, and then he would wad it up and toss it onto the table. And then the servant would know, ah, oh, oh, my master is finished. He's done with me. He's done with the meal. It's all done. It is finished. <laughs> but if the master folded his napkin neatly and placed it beside him, it meant he was coming back. If he rose from the table having it neatly folded, it meant he was coming back. So this we know, Jesus is coming back. What a selfless act, because he knew that the disciples were so discouraged, they thought all their dreams of the kingdom had come to an end. The hope that they had put in Jesus had seemed but a fleeting memory. And now they, they wallowed in despair, scattered. Jesus takes the time, there's glory in this, to do this simple act that they might know and give him, them a sign that they could understand that he is coming back, which is amazing. Now, we know that he's coming back, but he also says that he's coming back, which is just a, a powerful thing. He says that I will come again. I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again to receive you unto myself that you might be where I am. What a beautiful reassurance. Prophecy tells us this. The word reaffirms it. And everything that Jesus did reaffirms this. It's his inner glory. It's his inner glory. And he, we, it's, it's just, it's mind-blowing. It absolutely is. It really is. We know this, that he is coming back. So what will Jesus' glory look like when he comes back? We've talked about man's glory and that it's, it's to edify and build up to the glorification and outward building of ego, to the undoing of the Spirit and to the undoing of the workings of the Holy Spirit in us. We've talked about Christ's glory in his humbleness in coming, his goodness, his truthfulness. It's amazing. We've talked about these things. His mercy, his grace, his justice. These are all qualities of his glory. But what will it be like at his second coming? It's amazing. I'll tell you this. Will it be visible? Absolutely, it will be visible. It will be visible. We'll see him. We'll see him in the sky, right up there. Sorry, as my slides aren't working. <laughs> Bear with me. But it will also be literal. Now, there are some on earth that claim that Christ's already come, that it's a spiritual awakening or an epiphany in the mind, that Christ's glory is already upon us. But that's not what God says. That's not what Jesus says. When Jesus came to the apostles, after he had been resurrected, he didn't ascend immediately. He came to them and he said, they were scared, they were terrified of what they saw. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He will be real. So anchor that in your, in your hearts. He'll be real and literal, which is amazing. We know his coming will be visible. Here we go. Absolutely visible. What are we going to see? This is going to be an incredible manifestation. We see in Matthew 24, verse 26 to 27, he says, Therefore, if I say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning cometh out of the east, you know this one, cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Will Jesus even touch the ground when he comes? No. 
So imagine that, lay hold of that. I want to try and transport you all to this to make it real. I'm an artist, that's my, that's my job description, so I tend to think very visually, so I want to paint a picture for you all. When we make it real visually, it stays with us, it resonates with us. And all this to encourage you to lay hold of these things in, in the deepest sense. We're going to see lightning split the sky. It's going to divide the hemispheres of the earth from east to west. What an awesome display, again, of outward majesty now when he comes again. It's going to be a day unlike any other, a day unlike any other. So we can understand that while we know he will come in the sky, he will come with great power, he will come with the lightning, his feet won't touch the ground, we can rest assured and not be deceived that should we ever see someone come in the name of Christ, walking around, <laughs> pretending, preaching, the counterfeit, remember the enemy does this, and we know this, but I want to make sure that even people watching from afar know these things, that they not be deceived, people beholding through media today, his feet won't touch the ground. So if we see that, we know it's not Jesus. But I want to encourage you. I'm not going to talk about him. I'm going to talk about Jesus. We'll keep our eyes on Jesus. How does he come? Does he come with the clouds? He does. Bear with me. <laughs> How does he come? Every eye will see him. Ooh. Bear with me, family. I'm getting used to the clicker. Every eye will see him. Not some, every. Now people say, well, Jared, what do you mean every eye? Do you mean people in the grave or people elsewhere or around the globe? I'm like, no, no, everyone's living. And they go, what do you mean? At, at the one time? And I say, no, no, we live in a spherical earth. We've proven that. I'm sure we've proven that. He'll go up on the curve of the earth. So when Jesus says every eye, he means every eye alive at the time of his coming. And he will go up on the circle of the earth and he will gather his elect from the four winds, bringing them to him. Every eye will see him, not at the same time, but every eye will see him. It says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, they will eventually see him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Why? Why does it say that? Every eye, that sounds really hopeful. Every eye will see him, but all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Because remember, God won't change your heart at his second coming. He'll only change your frame. This mortal will put on immortality. This corruption will put on incorruption. It's the consummation of it. They mourn because they are incomplete. They have not beheld the glory of God at his first coming and cannot partake of the glory of his second. Friends, it's, it's incumbent upon this heart, even though we, we know these things, to internalize them, to make them real. Are you ready? Kindly, are you ready? Let him change your heart. Surrender your heart. Every eye will see him. That's amazing. He, he astounds me in so many ways. And he brings me to tears in many ways for what he's done for me and what he continues to do in planet Earth through assurance, through his word, and through the workings with personal testimonies. It's powerful. How will he come? And in what medium will he come? It says in the word, he's coming with the clouds. We know this. Well, Jared, what do you mean clouds? You mean clear and nimbus clouds? You mean fluffy clouds? You mean storm clouds? No, clouds of angels, clouds of angels, powerful angels, exceeding in strength. Imagine it, go to that place. We can't always establish these images in our mind, but I want you to make it real, desperately real, so that we can all be ready, and we can be ready. It says in Matthew, Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. That's amazing. His people, his people will literally, when we are brought to him, 
by beholding we are changed, his people will literally be the throne of his glory. It's why he's coming, because he loves us. He first loved us. That's why he's coming, not to make a political statement, not to make a, a power statement, but to redeem us. Imagine every angel, every angel. Heaven will literally be emptied. Why? Because this is not so much just about Jesus coming. A dear friend of mine said to me, this is not just Jesus. It shouldn't just be he is coming. It should be they are coming. Why? Because they have watched us. Paul says we're a theater to the universe. But the sufferings and the terrible scar of sin and what is done, they have watched and have been sent forth at the command of Christ to impress us on our hearts, to help us in our toils, to alleviate suffering at the command of Christ. Angels have been so invested and all of heaven has mobilized the energy expended to get us to heaven, or rather, I should say, to be fetched to heaven, because we can't go there. We have to be fetched and brought back. The energy expended is monumental. David and um, Daniel, sorry, forgive me, Daniel in his word tries to lay hold of the sheer number of angels when he says in Daniel 7, 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Imagine it. This is a day unlike any other. But here's the thing. All this spectacle all this outward manifestation of glory, it will be eclipsed by the majesty on high, the sovereign Lord of hosts, the Son of Man when he comes in glory, stationed in the midst of them. He will eclipse that glory. It's, are you waiting for this? I'm waiting for this. I know my own, I can only speak for my own present affliction in this life, the things I've been through, I can only report the things that I have seen and I have heard, and I tell you, nothing compares to this. And so let us invest everything we have, physically, financially. I'm talking about investing in all we have, sacrificing, giving from our sacrifice. But the biggest sacrifice you can make and the biggest miracle there is, is a transformed heart. A dear friend once told me, that for angels, miracles are mundane. They're as, a, as mundane as having breakfast. You all had breakfast today, right? Yeah. But a transformed heart, that is a miracle. That is a miracle. And it's a miracle that it doesn't just take when you receive it. As you have, so have freely received, so we freely give the glory he has given us of a contrite spirit, a humble heart, a transformed heart, a clean heart, giving service to others, deferring, giving preference to others, showing mercy, grace, justice, truth. These are qualities of his name. These are qualities of his glory. Then in the time of Moses and in the time of Christ and now as we approach steadily his coming glory. I just want us to lay hold of that that this may be very real in our minds and the longing of our heart. Whew, it's powerful. Will it be audible? Yes, the coming of the Lord will be audible. How do we know this? How do we know this? Jeremiah says, therefore prophesy against them all these words and say unto them, the Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fault. He will give a shout as those that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Wow, that's amazing. Paul declares, for the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Can I get an amen? That is, that is the glory of God. That is the redemption at hand. That he will come and not only take us, we who remain alive with him, he will restore to, 
us, the people we've lost, the people lost in time, the people who have passed away, people who have perished, all are alive to Christ in the blessed promise and hope of his blessed coming again. I'm so thankful for that, Lord. So it will be literal. It'll be visual. It'll be audible. Now, friends, I can't spare you. It will be cataclysmic. My job is to tell you the truth and report the things that I have seen and the things that I have heard. And the word tells me it will be cataclysmic. And I'll tell you how. Yes, I'll tell you how. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Go there. Peter declares, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That doesn't mean it's secret. It means it will come unannounced. It will come unannounced. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens... The sky, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. I told you this was an encouraging message. Bear with me. I have to tell you the truth. Peter goes on to say, and this is all to do with inner glory. Peter goes on to say, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? I have to tell you the truth, friends. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The second coming will not change our hearts. Only beholding the glory of Christ in his first coming and his interpersonal ministry day by day by day, and the intercession of the Holy Spirit day by day by day, growing in glory to glory, growing up into Christ. Only that can make us ready to be transformed, to be consummated, and to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there we will be forever. Ah, It's amazing. One more thing. I'll get this right yet. It'll be tactile. It'll be tactile. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall totter like a hut. Its transgression will be heavy upon it. And it will fall and not rise again. Brothers and sisters, I did say this was an encouraging message. I tell you all these things because I tell you the truth, because I love every single one of you. And Jesus loves you infinitely more than I ever could. And he is calling us today. Knowing all these things, that it's visual, that it's literal, that it's visible, that it's audible, that it's tactile, and every sense will be overwhelmed in that day. Knowing all these things can strike a chord of fear in us, but... None of these things would be important if his coming weren't also personal. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. Yeah, it's it's so amazing that Jesus would come and do what he's done and yet continue to do it even when we sin. He says, he is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can keep going again while he yet may be found. So friends, I implore you, when you hear his voice, follow his voice. This, this really, really uplifts me. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, friends. Because in Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 8, it says, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. It's so easy to be frightened by these things. Even now, knowing what we do, to be anchored in the world, to be fearful of the persecutions, to a 
glorious spirit of man, if you take my meaning, persecuting and subjugating and deferring the glory of God in us. It's so easy to be fearful, but we know his coming is personal. It's so personal. We shall endure the tribulations. We will. If we have Christ with us every day, if we lay hold of that every day, and we shall be changed. Not by our own power, not by merit of our own glory, but by the glory of his good name manifested to Moses and manifested in the time of Jesus, speaking to all that he would do. It's also transformative. And as we close, I'll, I'll do my best to consummate this second coming. Thank you, brother. It's also transformative, knowing first this, that we are transformed inwardly of the inner man and then in that last day, outwardly. So I exhort you, brothers and sisters, if I can, as we continue this series on salvation, nothing would do me more, give me more joy than to come with kindly appeal. It doesn't matter where, we, where we're at or who we are or who we think we are because we're so lifted up so many times by man's glory. Sometimes we're so far past regarding others because we're so invested in our own glory. And I speak to myself. I've done this to the detriment of my own soul. I've done this because I haven't regarded the import of others because I haven't regarded them. But God's glory changes the heart. So my appeal is this, for those here, for those watching, because we can be, we can be justified, but we also need to be converted. Peter walked with Christ, but he wasn't converted. Jesus said to him, and when you are converted, and many of us come, we come and we go, and we come and go in our church lives, but we don't always lay hold of the coming of God, which is real, visible, tangible, tactile, audible, personal, transformative. When we lay hold of this, it changes the heart, and it makes our walk with him the most important thing we will ever do. Brothers and sisters, as we close, if it's on your heart, if you have beheld the glory of Jesus, if you have behold the glory of God in his compassion, his mercy, his justice, his truthfulness, his graciousness, his goodness, if you have beheld and seen that all his goodness has passed before you, just as it was in the time of Moses, so it was in the time of Christ, so it shall be, when you behold this, if you would like to renew your walk with Jesus, or if you would like to come to the Lord now, Please, I'd invite you to stand. I'd invite you to stand and, and, and humble the peel. If even you've drifted away from the Lord or this lockdown, this quarantine has driven wedges in family, this is, this is what the Lord placed on my heart to share and this is what I've labored to do. I need to tell you something. I wrote a sermon today and I wrote it word for word because I was too worried that I would get it right. But praise the Lord, when the Spirit comes, he answers. And I'm just so thankful because he's placed on this heart a burden to say, if you want to accept him, you can. You can come as you are. And if you've drifted away, I would exhort you with these faithful words. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, treasured wives, love your husbands. Honored children, honor your parents. Such is the glory of God in the inner man. And we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, blessed day. And as we close, I just want to leave you with these comforting thoughts. That it's not behavior, it's not by beholding our behavior that brings about our glorification. It's by beholding his glory. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father God, you are so wonderful. Your good name says so many things, Lord. 
and your glory speaks to so many qualities. Such a sermon as this could stretch on forever because you are forever, Lord, and your search is your glory and the concept of it, that it is not the manifestation to the building of ego, to the detriment of the spirit, but rather it is the edifying of the inner man and the qualities of humility. Father, may your glory fall upon us as we beheld you then. Father, we cling to you now that we might love kindness, do justice, and live humbly before the Lord. Such is your glory, Lord, your transformative glory, changing the inner man as Moses was. May we be found standing on the rock, hidden in the cleft, and shielded by your hand. And that rock is Jesus Christ, Lord. And that cleft of the rock is the shelter that only Jesus can bring. But Lord, this time, when you come in glory and you remove your hand, you will have finished the work that you have done in the hearts of men. You have consummated us, Lord, fit for your courts of glory. And we just praise you and we thank you, Jesus, that when you remove your hand, the work will be done. And thus will ring the faithful statement, well done, good and faithful servant. I bring you to myself, he will tell you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do. Lord, we have beheld your glory. All your goodness has passed before us and it has changed our hearts forever. Thank you, Jesus. This is our hope, our blessed hope in you of your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray that we can lay hold of it, that we can internalize it, that we can make it real, that we can make it the number one prerogative in our walk here on earth, that we might share the hope that is in us with others, that they also might be where you are for all time to come. Father, we love you, we bless you, we bless you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.